I just want us to understand why we stand up when we read God's word. All right, Acts 4, starting in verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common, and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them. And brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it. And brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. And now it was about three hours later... When his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Let us pray. Lord God, we just come humbly, Father, to your throne of grace tonight. Father, we are in awe of your righteousness. We are in awe of your amazingness, Father. We are in awe of who you are and how amazing you are, Father. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. We don't love you because of anything we've done. We don't love you because we got ourselves to love you. We only love you because you loved us first and you sent your son to die for us. Through the conviction and the the pulling of your Holy Spirit, you drew us to you, Father. And so, Lord, we thank you for loving us first and drawing us to you. Father, tonight we thank you for your holy word and just pray, Father, that you will add a blessing to the reading and hearing of your word in our hearts and minds, that, Father, we will be blessed by the hearing and, 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 and reading of your word, and it will truly change us, Father. And, Lord, I pray tonight that your Holy Spirit would preach through me now with power and authority, that, Father, your Holy Spirit would just preach through me, Father. Let the words be yours, and, Father, I pray that you will anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet from one high, Lord. Father, I love you, I bless you, and I praise you now and just pray your word will go forth and accomplish what you send it out to do. And I pray you will flood this building with your Holy Spirit, Father. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right. So, this is Acts. This is the book the Acts of the Apostles. So the work and the ministry and the the work that the apostles did. This is after Jesus arose from heaven, or arose to go to heaven. He arose from the grave. He showed up and revealed himself to many of the disciples and the apostles. He went to heaven and the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles in the upper room. And now we see the apostles going out and doing the Lord's work. 
And so what we see is that the very first thing, they were with one heart and one soul. What is one word that describes what is happening right here with the church in Acts 4? Unity. They were together. The Holy Spirit was working in them that they were one family, one group with one mission and one purpose. And they were working together, not for selfish gain, not for what they wanted or what they for their names, not for any of those things. But they were working together as one group for God's glory. You see, Satan hadn't got into the church yet and started causing issues. The wolves hadn't come in yet. The, the, the devil's tactics hadn't separated the church yet. And I keep saying yet because we're about to see how quickly the devil jumped in with both feet to try to attack the church. And notice it says that, um, that neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. What that means in today's vernacular is if I have something, it's all of ours. I didn't have anything with my name on the deed or my name on the title. It was all of ours. If I had something, anybody could use it at any time. That's what that meant, that they worked together. Anything anybody had, if somebody had a need of it, they were right there. Here you go, brother. Here you go, sister. Use what I have to accomplish what you need. They were one heart and one soul together as a family, working together to accomplish God's will. And so it says, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great power. That's pretty cool. That is one of the things that the church in America is missing today. The church has, does not have great power. We don't. We are dead as a group of people. There are... There are other sinful groups out there that have way more power and influence than the church today. And it all goes back to what I preached about this morning about faith. The church in America does not have the faith of the New Testament that God tells us we are supposed to have once we get saved. And so with great power, they were giving witness. They were talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now... If anyone ever wants to tell you the resurrection is un, unimportant, they have no clue what they're talking about. The resurrection is part and parcel, is central to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus was still in the grave, Paul said to the church at 1 Corinthians, he said, we're of men most miserable. There's no point in us doing what we're doing if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. And so we, we need to remember that Jesus is alive. We're not serving a dead Jesus. We're not serving a Jesus in the grave. We're not serving a Jesus that, that 2,000 years ago died and that's it. No, we're serving a Jesus who's alive, sitting at the right-hand throne of God the Father in heaven right now. That, my friends, is what we, gives us great power. And we need to remember that we need to tell this world that we're dead in sin, but we can be made alive through the one who who conquered death, hell, and the grave on the cross of Calvary. And, and then we tell them about the blood. We learned Wednesday that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, no forgiveness. you got to have the blood, and Jesus gave that. But you see, through the blood we have forgiveness, and then we have eternal life because Jesus arose from the dead. And so they were going around with great power preaching that right there. Friends, that's power. That's what saves people, that right there. Don't be afraid to tell them that Jesus is alive. They might think you're crazy, but you know what? They're the crazy ones for not believing. You give them the good news and let God deal with them. Okay, so we keep going here. And what was the result of this? Great grace was upon them all. Friends, we need to squirrel a little bit here. You see, the implication is that the leadership, the apostles, the preachers were preaching the gospel. The leadership of the church was preaching what needed to be preached. And they were living it and they were doing it. And what was the result of that? Great grace was upon all of them. 
Friends, if our leadership isn't doing what's right, God's grace is not going to fall on this church. It will not happen. When you have leadership that's living for self and doing what self wants and self gratification and self glory and look at me, 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 God's grace will not be on the church. And we've got that problem, friends. We do. Go a different route. Leadership in the country. When, when a leadership, a president, a congress, and all these people across the land who are leaders aren't godly and aren't doing what's right, God's grace will not befall the people. You notice that the grace was on everybody. It doesn't just say the leadership. It doesn't just say the apostles, the preachers. It was on them all. How God responds to the people is, how, is directly related to how the, the leadership is doing. Do you guys understand that? And the reason we have ungodly leadership right now is because God is punishing America. The reason we have the leadership that we have in Washington, D.C. and many of the state capitals around this nation is because God says, I am done with the lack of people in the church living for Jesus and I'm tired of the wickedness, I'm tired of the sin, and I'm bringing my wrath on America. You cannot convince me otherwise. If you read the Old Testament over and over and over, when Israel was being blessed, it was because they were blessing God and living right. And they slowly faded away from God. And when they faded away from God, every single time God would raise up an ungodly, evil, wicked king or leader to bring his wrath and punishment on the people. And that is where we're at today. And you know how it gets changed, friends? Do you know how we get this country back on track? It starts in the church house. You see, judgment starts in the house of God is what Scripture teaches. It doesn't start in D.C. It doesn't start in Charleston. It doesn't start at Wood County Courthouse or Capitol Building. It starts in the house of God. When we get it right, then we go out and we start leading other people to get it right. And it's a ripple effect that will lead the nation back. But if we don't ever get it right, this country will never come back. And, and, and some people think I'm a pessimist. I don't believe I'm a pessimist. I, I call myself a realist. What I see when I read the scripture, Jesus says, when I return, will I even find faith on earth? We're told in the end days there will be a great falling away. And what we're seeing, there's a great falling away in the church. There's, Jesus is even talking about the church. Will I even find faith in the church when I come back? And if we're not living faithfully, well, there's that faith thing again. Ain't God cool? If we're not living faithfully, we can't expect the world to live faithfully. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were, they were getting mad at somebody who, who was saying some things they shouldn't have been saying. And I said, don't get mad at them. They're an unbeliever. Expect that. That's what unbelievers do. They don't know any better. What we need to get mad at is what's called righteous indignation is in the church house. When the church people aren't doing right, that's when we get upset. When an unbeliever acts as an unbeliever, you expect a horse to act like a horse, a donkey to act like a donkey, and a cow to act like a cow. Amen? You expect an unbeliever to act like an unbeliever, don't you? You don't get mad at the unbeliever because they curse, because they drink, because they do those things. You have compassion on them. You have love, grace, and mercy. You pray for them, and then you give them the resurrection story. Now, the people in the church house, oh, that's a different story. That's where we get mad because y'all know. Y'all know better. Y'all have heard it over and over and over and over. That's where God gets the maddest. Is the people who come to church and still just play. And so, all right, getting back here. All right. So, grace was upon them all. Verse 34. Now, nor was there any among them who lacked. They had everything they needed, friends. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them. Wait a minute. You mean following Jesus is so serious in the New Testament that they sold everything they had to follow Jesus? Yep. That's exactly what happened in the New Testament church. 
They didn't care about their houses anymore. They didn't care about their farms anymore. They didn't care about their buggies or their horses. They didn't care about any of that. They sold it all so they could meet the needs of the people around them. Why? So they could pat themselves on the back and get a big head? No. So they could say, you need Jesus. The reason I'm giving you this is because you need Jesus. The reason I'm doing this is because Jesus loves you and he wants you to know that. And they were taking care of each other and the lost. They were selling everything they had and giving it to the treasury of the church and said, here you go. Here you go. Do with it what you need. And the other thing was they didn't hold back and go, and I've seen this and I've heard of this. And a lot of people do this. Well, I'm only going to give to the things that I want to give to. <laughs> We're going to get to that in a minute. I'm jumping ahead. Because what they did is they sold, they gave it to the treasury and said, do what God leads you to do. Praise be to God. Amen. To have enough faith in the Lord to say, he told me to sell it, I'm going to sell it and just live by faith. There's a scripture that says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Well, the church today has got it backwards. We walk by sight, not by faith. This church, 2,000 years ago, they got it. They're like, we're selling it all. We're going to walk by faith. Lord will provide. He'll take care of it all. I'll do what he wants. And we'll distribute it as anyone has need. You notice it, it, it doesn't say anyone who met certain qualifications had need. There was a time in this church when I first started where there was this mentality that we don't want to give people money. We don't want to give people gift cards. We don't want to do that. We'll give money to someone else and let them deal with the people. That was one of my first big things that I stood up and I said, uh-uh, that ain't going to happen. We are going to reach the people ourselves because that's what God calls us to do. We're not going to give it to somebody else to give it to somebody to then turn around and give it to people. We're going to give directly to the people. But you notice it doesn't say, hey, if they, you know, meet below a certain amount. Hey, if they look a certain way. It says anyone who had what? Need. Well, that's pretty cool. I think that's interesting because when we drive along and we see someone holding a sign that says, can you donate, need food? We always think about how they might be using it for drugs or alcohol or they might have another job or this, that, or the other, don't we? We go through the checklist in our mind of why we're not going to give. Surely I'm not the only one who's done that. We've all done that. But he says, they distributed to each as anyone had need. Wow. You talk about love. You talk about love, man. That flies in the face of what we call love, doesn't it? And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated the son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, they're just... They're telling you right now that this guy was a Jew who got saved, okay? That's the point of that. He had land, and he sold it, and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. He walks up. He says, here you go. He didn't say, hey, Peter, James, John, here's the money, but I'm telling you what. We need to get the pews with the, the blue carpet, and, and we need to... You know, make sure that there's not a clock on the wall. If I give you the money, then I'm going to expect that you're going to put a plaque on it saying my name. You notice they didn't do that. They just said, here you go. Barnabas said, here you go. Here's the money. Do, what you, do with it what you need. Well, is this just about money? No. Because they were meeting needs. Roxy. Whenever somebody has an illness and they need someone to sign up to bring food, that's meeting the needs. That falls exactly in line with what the early church was doing. They were meeting the needs of the people. If you can't cook, you can do DoorDash.
Did you know that? You can, you can, you can buy pizzas. I've seen Kurt. I hope he's listening. He'll eat pizzas. He'll eat anything you bring him. Jennifer will too, because she's gracious. All right, let's keep going in chapter 5. But a certain man, here, here's where we're really getting to th- tonight. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. He kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So, let me just run this down for you. Ananias and Sapphira, they're believers, they're part of the church. They see Barnabas doing this, they see the other um, believers, they see all this goodness happening. And what I believe happens here is they get convicted. The Holy Spirit said, hey, Ananias and Sapphira, you have this possession. I want you to sell that and bring that money and lay it at the apostles' feet for them to give to people in need. And so they go, okay, great, we'll do that, Lord. And so Ananias and Sapphira, they're, they're working together. They're both in agreement. They go sell the possession, and then they come. And before they go and lay the money at the apostles' feet, they go, huh, let's use an easy round number, 100 bucks. We just made 100 bucks. If we take 50 and keep it ourselves, and we'll take 50 and take it to the church, And make them think that we gave them everything. You see, one of the things that that we do in our lives is we make implications. And that's called deception. You see, what Ananias and Sapphira were doing here was deceiving. They were trying to get the church to believe that they had given everything. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Meanwhile, they kept 50 bucks in their pocket. Now, what's wrong with keeping 50 bucks? We're about to see in a minute, that's not the problem. That's not the problem. You see, Peter said in verse 3, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? All right, so what's going on? He says in his heart, Lord's telling me to do it. I'm going to sell it. And then I'm going to keep part of it instead of giving the whole amount because that's what God said to do. Amen? God told him, give it. But he goes, nah, I'll just keep part of it myself. Times are tough and you look at your tithe and you go, whew, I know I need to be giving my $50 tithe this week, but man, I could really use it. I'll just do 40 God will be okay with it. Well, according to this scripture, God's not okay with it. God is not okay with when we do that because in Malachi it says bring your first fruits not after you've paid your bills not after you've eaten out in a hundred dollars not after you've bought your gas not after any of that no your first fruits the very first thing you get you set aside and it goes to the church this is the same principle that we're looking at here is keeping what is God's away from God okay And so we keep going. He says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? And here's what's interesting. Who was the other person that Satan went into their heart and filled their heart? What? Uh, Okay, think outside this story. Judas, thank you. You remember in Luke it says that the devil, the, the, the Satan, actually entered the mind and heart of Judas. Now we see it again. Friends, we don't understand the spiritual battle that we're really fighting. It's real. 
It's legit. It's, it's happening all around us, and we don't even know it's going on. Satan entered his heart, filled his heart. In verse 4 it says, While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. You see, here's the crux of it. Peter's like, dude, it was yours. You owned it. You didn't have to sell it. But when you did... The Holy Spirit told you to do it, and instead of giving all that the Holy Spirit told you to do, you held back and then lied. You see the problem? A couple problems. Greed. Not loving other people more than self. Lying. Here's what I tell my kids. A half-truth is a whole lie. You see, he told half the truth. Here's, here's 50 bucks. Here's 50 bucks. That's half the truth. But as you can see in God's eyes, that's a whole lie. That's a whole lie. If you tell part of the story and you leave out part, you might as well just say, I'm lying. Because that's what's going on here. He said, while it was your own, it was yours. You could have done with it what you wanted, Ananias. Why? But you conceived this thing in your heart. You went, all right, God's telling me to do this. But I can just do half of it and put the other part in my pocket. They'll never know. God has a way of revealing things that uh, we don't even understand. Galatians 6, 7 says, God will not be mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If we sow lies, we reap lies. If we sow goodness, we We reap goodness. God will not be mocked. We need to understand that when we lie to each other, when we lie to God, when we lie to the Holy Spirit, we are mocking God. How many of us in here, by a show of hands, and I want your honest opinion or your honest answer, how many of you in here love being mocked? Oh, nobody? Well, that's kind of surprising. Why is it surprising? Because we mock God all the time. When we don't do what he tells us to do, we're mocking God. When we say that we're believers but we don't live for him, we're mocking God. When we don't follow through and do what he tells us to do, we're mocking him. We're literally mocking God. None of us in here like it. We all just agreed, amen? I mean, I didn't miss any... Hands with those lights, right? Let me, let me ask again. Does anybody in here like being mocked? Okay, I can see clearly now. Not a single hand. None of us like being mocked. Then why do we do it to our God? Why do we mock God? You realize if you say you're going to go somewhere and do something, and you don't, you're mocking God. You realize that if you say, God, I'm going to give you this $100 this week, and then you go, man... I need five bucks. I'm just going to give you 95, Lord, and I'm going to keep five. You're mocking God. Even if you keep a dollar, if God says to give a hundred and you tell God, you make a promise, I'll give you the hundred you told me to do, and you keep a dollar, you're mocking God. And here's the other thing. Check this out. It says, you have not lied to men, but to God. I'm going to go on a little squirrel for you just real quick, okay? Uh, Go back to verse 3, second part. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You see that? Right there, Peter's saying that he's lying to the Holy Spirit. Then you drop down to verse 4, and he says you're lying to God. Well, either 
either the Trinity is real and this is showing us two parts of the Trinity or the Bible's not real. The Bible's real, friends, and right here we see two parts of the Trinity. We see that, that, that Peter says you're lying to the Holy Spirit, and then he says you're lying to God. Those two are one in the same. They're, they're, they're together, they're one, but they're separate. They're part of the Trinity. And so what we see here is confirmation of two of the three parts of the Trinity. Isn't that awesome? How many times do we miss little things like that? Look at that. That's powerful. And he says, Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So as soon as Peter tells him, you've lied to God, he falls down and took his last breath. Now, does that mean that he was standing, took his last breath and fell or did he take his last breath on his way down falling? Or did he fall and take his last breath while he was on the ground? Don't know. That's going to be kind of cool to find out for me when we get to heaven. You all might be like, well, that's kind of silly. Why do you care? I just think it's interesting, those little tidbits that we just don't know when we get to heaven. You know, was they like, oh! You know, I don't know. But I think it's interesting to think of those things. Um, when I study the Word, those are things I think about. I want to know the intricacies. I want to know the details. I want to know what it was like. I want to, you know, smell the salt air. I want to see the desert. I, I, wanted, I want the word to be alive, which is what the Bible tells us it is, that it is alive. And so the, I think of things like that. And so I just want to encourage you to do the same when you read it. Don't just, broom, okay, read the Bible. I'm good. No, no, stop. Read it. Look through it. Think about these things. Chew on it. Digest it. And I'm going to get into more of this here soon with the Bible, how to Bible study. But these are just some things to start thinking about before we get that far. And so he falls down and breathes his, his last breath. What does that mean happened to Ananias? He died. Yeah. So do you think that like science can explain this and like he had some, you know, heart attack and this, that, or the other? Maybe. Maybe not. But either way, God took that last breath from him and said, you're done. However it happened, I don't think it was a heart attack. I, I think it was just God went, boom, you're done, son. Bam, last breath over with. You're dead. And so the men come in, they wrap him up, and they take him out and they bury him. But don't miss this. It says, great fear came upon all those who heard these things. Why do you think they had great fear? Do you think they were like, man, this Peter guy, he like kills people. He must be in the mafia. Do you think that's what they were thinking? Do you think, man, this, this Peter guy, he like, he, he just, he's amazing and, and he can do whatever. I don't think so. I think they recognized and realized they lied to, he lied to God. And God said, I'm done. I will not be mocked. And took his life. So they had a fear of the Lord Almighty. Friends, you would do well if you would get back to that place to have that fear of God in your life. All right, so they wrapped him up, they carried him out, and they buried him. Now it was about three hours later, all right? His wife came in. What does it mean come in? They were in a tent probably or the upper room, one of the two, I'm not sure. But, but kind of get that in the picture, okay? Sapphira comes in. She didn't know what happened. She didn't know her husband was dead. You would think, or I would think anyways, that the word had spread and, and they'd been like, Sapphira, Sapphira, your husband's dead. He's dead, he's dead. But that didn't happen. The men were like, I ain't saying a word. I ain't getting in the middle of this one. Uh-uh. They were probably in such shock that they couldn't even imagine going and telling anybody what had just happened. So she comes in, and Peter says, Hey, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. He gives an opportunity for her to do what is right. I'll tell you what, when I was a kid, man, I hated that. Because I instantly started thinking, does my parents know what I did or do they not? 
Are they testing me because they know, or are they testing me because they have an inkling, or are they testing me because they just assume I'm going to be doing something I shouldn't be doing? I mean, any of the three were re realities in my life growing up, okay? You need to understand that. And so that brought, that brought a, a level of anxiety to me. And what I realized later on once I got saved, you know what? If you just tell the truth the whole time, it doesn't matter. You don't got to worry about do they know or not. And so I can imagine at this point, Sapphire is like, why is he asking me this? You know, why, why would Peter be asking me if we sold it for 100 bucks? And she said, yeah, yeah, that's what we sold it for. You got it. Peter, you're good, man. I'm sure at this point she was thinking, Peter, you got it. Why are you asking me? Like, you knew. And so Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, this would be so scary. Look, he says, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. So now, we learn something new. We've learned that a half-truth is a whole lie. We've learned that when God tells us to do something, we do it all. We've learned that God will not be mocked. Now we learn about testing the Spirit of God. You see, I'll do the same thing with my kids. I'll already know. And I'll ask them something. I'm giving them the opportunity to do what is right. Anybody else do that with their kids? Yeah. Don't you love it? Don't you love it? Because you already know. And you, you just so badly want them to, to just confess and do what's right, don't you? But this goes back to that thing I, I've mentioned many times. How many of us taught our kids to lie and deceive? None of us. They just do it, don't they? They know. And so, we'll ask and we'll say, what'd you do here? Knowing the answer. You see, that's what Peter was doing. He knew. And he was giving her an opportunity to do what was right. She'd already sinned. She'd already was a part of this scheme. She had already lied to God in her heart. And now, Peter says, hey, how much did you get for that? Was it 100 bucks? when in fact it was 200 Yeah, yeah, Peter, that's right, you got it. And instantly, Peter says, look, the feet of those who carried your husband out to bury him are at the door, and they're going to carry you out. What Peter just said was, you're dead. You know, when someone's on the, in prison and they're walking to, their, to death row, dead man walking, dead woman standing. And I'm not making fun, I'm not making light. Like, that's literally what was happening. But what we found out was that when she had the opportunity to do what was right, she was testing the Holy Spirit. Wow, isn't that interesting? Y'all know what I'm talking about when you've done something you shouldn't have and someone asks you and you start thinking, do they know? Or are they asking because they know? And, and then that kind of panic sets in a little bit. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a sibling. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a kid even. Ananias had the opportunity to do what was right. God gave her that chance. An or Sapphira, tell us the truth. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. We've been talking a lot about that with these gifts of the Holy Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit, amen? Doing the right thing. 
and immediately, not five seconds, not an hour, immediately, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. The young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. You know, maybe God needs to just start dropping people left and right in the church. And you know what? Maybe he does that and we don't realize it. Maybe some of these diseases that we've been battling, maybe some of these car accidents, maybe some of these things are God's wrath coming on us. And we always attribute it to everything else. But maybe, just maybe, God's saying, you're done. I've given you chance after chance after chance after chance to do the right thing, and you will not do it. You see, because we can wear God's patience thin. As a parent, there are some days when I just wake up and I just look at my kids and my patience are this thin. There are other days I wake up and, and they, can, they can do anything and I'm, I'm good. You see, I'm human, but God's not. God is God. And he allows us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, just like he did Sapphira, to do what's right. But eventually, he'll say, enough's enough. You're done. 1 Corinthians 9, 6. So sparingly, reap sparingly. So bountifully, you will also reap bountifully. Each one of you has, as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You see, they weren't a cheerful giver. God told them, hey, give this amount. Do this. And instead of going, hey, great, thanks God for the opportunity to be a part of your church, a part of your kingdom, and to give this, I want to do this, Lord, I, I willingly, freely want to give. They went, nope, I'm not going to give freely. I'm going to hold back, and I'm going to keep part of it, and then I'm going to lie about it. Not to men, but to God and the Holy Spirit. You see, when you, when, you give, when you don't give, and I'm not talking about tithing. Tithing is the 10%, and then giving is what you give above that. So you give your 10% of your, your money. You give 10% of your time helping other people, and you give 10% of your resources. That, that, that is a bare minimum. That's the minimum you do, okay? You, you give 10%. That's Old Testament law. We believe that. We follow that. And you give 10% of everything. Then anything above that, like if your tithe is a hundred dollars and you give a hundred and ten dollars, you tithe ten and you gave, or you tithed a hundred and you gave ten. If you have twenty four hours in a day, that means two point four hours a day should be helping someone doing something, right? That's ten percent. Amen. My math's good. I was looking for confirmation. You all like? <laughs> I I thought I was right, but I just needed to know. You know, and, and maybe, maybe that's praying for somebody. That's actually serving someone when you pray for them. Did you know that? We, we think it must be showing up and doing something, and that's part of it. But it can be also praying for them. It can be sending them a, a letter of encouragement or a, 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 a card of encouragement. It can be lots of different ways that we help and serve other people. Okay? And then 10%. Of our resources. Give it away. Let people use it. We do it freely. You see, they weren't giving freely. They were giving because they wanted to be seen. They were giving because other people were doing it. And if everybody else is doing it and getting their pats on the back and kudos and good job... We need to be a part of that is what Ananias and Sapphira were thinking. I truly believe that. They were like, well, 
I don't really want to give everything, so I'm just going to keep part, but I'll get my pat on the back, and everybody will go, wow, Ananias and Sapphira, they're so spiritual. They always jump up and help everybody. Not everybody who helps everybody is actually very spiritual. You just need to understand that. Just because someone's helping doesn't mean they're doing it for the right reason. They were giving, but it was the wrong reasons. So much so that God took their lives. Interesting, isn't it? That tells us that our hearts need to be right before we start giving. And how do you get your heart right? You get right with Him. Man, it just keeps coming up, doesn't it? Over and over and over. If this is not right, this will never be right. We've got to get this relationship right before this relationship will ever make it anywhere. I'm going to give you one last verse. Turn with me to Matthew 6, 38. Amen. That ain't right. Never mind, I'm not going to give you that one. I wrote it down wrong. Never mind, forget that one. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm in Matthew. What in the world? I have written down Luke 6.38. I turned to Matthew. Did I say Matthew? I was reading Luke and I said Matthew. Wow. Let's try Luke 6.38. Let's see what that is. Ah, this is it. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Whenever I read that about it overflowing, I always think of of the 32nd Psalm, Psalm, my cup runneth over. If you give, God will give back. But you've got to have that heart that's right. You see, because if you give... Like Ananias and Sapphira, begrudgingly, wanting to keep it, wanting to be seen, greedy. God's not going to bless that. The context of Luke 6, 38 is you give because you want to give. You want to love. You want to help other people. And you don't care if anybody ever knows that you gave it. Only God knows. And that's all that should matter. So... My encouragement for you tonight. Don't be an Ananias and Sapphira. Because we never know when God will say enough's enough. Because it will happen. I promise you, it will happen. All right, let's pray, guys. Lord, we love you and bless you tonight. Thank you, Father, for this word. Thank you, Father, for your spirit and uh, preaching through me tonight, Father, and, and preparing hearts and minds. And I just pray none of us will be and Ananias and Sapphira, that each of us will just love you, Lord, with every ounce of who we are. And, and Father, we will want to give freely and lovingly. And, Lord, we will want to do it not to get back, not to be seen, not because we do it begrudgingly or under compulsion, reluctantly, but because, God, we love you and we love other people. So I pray that we will be givers, Lord, that we will start giving not only money, but our time and talents and treasures. And, Father, we will just absolutely start serving other people once again as a church body, Father. We've gotten away from that, and I'm sorry that's happened, Father. I ask you to forgive us. And, Lord, I pray that as a church body, we will get back to loving and serving other people, Father. Lord, as we go out, I pray your blessings over everyone that, Father, not that we'll be blessed to have abundantly, but, Father, we will be blessed spiritually so we can bless others in the spiritual realm. And, Father, we can lead them to Jesus. 
And Father, I just pray you'll prepare the way. Go before us, Lord. We love you. We bless you and praise you now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, God bless you guys. Thanks.